Our guest today is Liev Yestvang. I met Liev in 2018 when I had the honor of coaching her on the TEDx Columbus stage. She has spent her career working in education, technology, and the arts, and is currently the Associate Vice President for Learning Technology at The Ohio State University. She's an educator who believes that learning can transform lives and communities, and that the places we work are opportunities for greater meaning and connection. Her team supports 370 classrooms, runs the learning technology tool set, and leads campus-wide programs to enhance innovation in teaching and learning. So you can imagine that since OSU transitioned to online classes in the spring, Leaves' expertise has been in high demand. She and her team have won a slew of awards, including the New Media Consortium's Center for Excellence Award, Apple's Distinguished Program, and OSU's Distinguished Staff Award. Her current project includes OSU's Affordable Learning Exchange, and it was implemented to reduce the cost of course content and encourage course transformation. The initiative has saved students more than a million dollars annually and is projected to save $10 million by the end of this year. Leave lives right here in Columbus, Ohio, with her two adorable kids and her partner, Julia. Please help me welcome Leave Yestvang. Pre COVID, what were your days like before we were in this crisis mode? So I work with teams that run all of the classrooms at Ohio State. We also run a program called Digital Flagship, which provides free technology to all incoming Ohio State students and a coding curriculum. We developed an app for wellness and mental health for students that's really about helping tie them to support resources and maybe understand some of the challenges they're experiencing and where and how to get help from meditating and connecting with friends to more formal resources like support groups and formal therapy or counseling. We run all of the tools. So this obviously became a really exciting part of my job in the last three months, but we run the tools like Zoom. We run our learning management system. Uh, We have a dozen kind of centrally operated tools that we run to support teaching and learning. And those were obviously really critical as we moved all of our teaching online. Yeah, I can only imagine that things blew up for you when, you know, it was like around March 9th or something like that, that you went on spring break at Ohio State and learned that spring break was going to go for two weeks. And when you came back, no one was coming back to campus. Everything was going online. So what happened in this crazy two-week period? Yeah, so, so I was actually in Seattle on March 1st, uh, with a number of colleagues, we were going to a national educational technology higher ed conference. And we got to Seattle and then quickly learned that the conference had been canceled because we were heading towards Bellevue, Washington, where the first uh, fatalities that were really publicly being shared in the news were, were being released. So the conference was canceled. And our team scrambled to head home. And uh, and very quickly at that point, it was the week prior that we had started really talking about what should we be doing to prepare for a possible shift of our educational venue. And so we had done that work. We were meeting. We very quickly stood up um, what we call the response team, which were the core people who do work that touches the kinds of planning and preparation we needed to do. We met every day. Um, At the time, we were face-to-face, which is a strange thought now to think of planning for a pandemic in a small space with lots of people (laughs) (laughs) face-to-face. And we, you know, I think people stepped up really quickly to start thinking about what, how do we even reconceive what education looks like when it suddenly moves into a virtual space for the Mm -hmm. first time for a lot of faculty who have not taught online, most of our students have taken online classes. So the learning part of it was maybe not such a shift for them in terms of how to do it. Although doing it outside of the university environment and all of the life changes and changes that students were experiencing, having to leave campus and live in other places, 
losing their jobs. There were a whole set of impacts for students. So, so for us, it was a, a really quickly trying to figure out, um, ensure that our tools were ready to handle the hit that they were about to experience, yeah, the learning tools. I, am, I imagine you had a lot more use of Zoom and other <laughs> technology tools. Yes. Yeah, so we we looked at those numbers at the end of the term and our the bulk of our learning tools, our learning management system uh, had about a 300% increase in use. Our Zoom usage went up by 2,350%. Oh my God. So yeah. Um, and it did a phenomenal job of really providing a space where students and their instructors could meet and continue learning. Mm-hmm. So in those first few weeks of teaching, I'm sure it was a lot of triage. And what were kind of the things that immediately you had to put attention to? So we very quickly stood up a collection, a small collection of websites. We realized that it was important for there to be one place for our community to go to learn about how we were going to do this differently and what it was going to look like and what was going to be expected of them. So we stood up a website called keepteaching.osu.edu, and then very quickly keep learning, and then keep working, and then keep researching. So the suite of four websites, we actually borrowed very heavily, as we like to do in higher ed, from Indiana University, who graciously shared a model that they had built um, several years ago for disaster preparedness in the case that they might have to go to a remote teaching situation. And we, those websites were designed to help people understand, you know, that spring break was being extended and when we were coming back and how, what kinds of tools were available to support teaching when you weren't in the same space as your students. We had to think about things like um, labs and performance classes and all kinds of things that, that actually are very hard to conceive of in a remote setting. But I would say mm -hmm. those websites were, were a really important place for, it, it was a helpful kind of place for us to start collecting ideas. And that was, it was an iterative process. So those sites were changing as we, um, as we built. And we were in very regular communication with the community to understand what was working and what we needed to add more of and change and develop as we went. So speaking of that, I mean, it, it sounds like once you got the communication set up where you could streamline it so that people had one place to go, what did you start to learn that you hadn't necessarily thought about or prepared for as all of this became real? So we we started out with what I would call kind of a um, maybe a practical and logistical focus to the recommendations that we were giving people because there was a very practical problem in our hands initially, which was how, if I've never taught online, how do I connect to people? How do I share lectures and assignments? So we started out with recommending a key set of strategies for faculty to set up our learning management system, which is where they can share student assignments, they can share a syllabus, they can organize a grade book um, and their course content. So having those basic elements of their course in place and trying to ensure that across all courses that students take, that there is a relatively similar structure so they could look in the same place in the learning management system to find the same things for different courses. Um, we started with that and then also helping people learn to use Zoom. And, and the, one of the first questions they had to ask was whether they wanted to try to teach their classes synchronously. So at the same time as they normally would teach and students, whether they now were at home in China or whether they were in California or here in Columbus would all have to find a way to log in at the original course time. Or were they going to record course material and let students connect any time during the week when they were able to get online? What were some of the benefits of being synchronous versus asynchronous and then maybe some of the, the detracting elements of each? So we thought initially that it was really important that we encourage people not to do synchronous. So we were very aware of students who may not have access to a computer at all hours of the day. They may be sharing with siblings or parents who also need to be online. Um, for students who are international and suddenly on a time zone that may put them 
in class in the middle of the night as opposed to during the afternoon. So we thought it would be better to provide the ultimate flexibility for students. And I think there was merit to that recommendation. What we found, we, we did some surveys soon after the semester ended. And what we saw is that the synchronous connection was actually really important. It was, it, it made it easier for faculty to teach when they were continuing to connect with and teach a group of students as opposed to just record a video lecture and post it online. And it was incredibly important for students to have that connection, a personal human connection to sort of figuratively be in the same room with other people. A, to support their learning, but I think in many ways because the world had turned upside down in so many ways and being connected to their peers and and having being able to kind of connect to their student identity in a classroom with a professor was a really important part and and what we saw that was particularly interesting to me is that the students we were most concerned about who were those who may have limited internet access um, or less resources were actually most likely to say that that synchronous connection was important to them that's fascinating. So the peop- the very people who maybe you were trying to plan around with the asynchronous were the people who were most craving the connection of the synchronous learning. Yeah. I mean, I think everyone was really craving that, that connection. I think that we, when we thought we were creating opportunities that would be more inclusive of students who had limitate, who had maybe the most limitations, we saw that they were particularly outspoken about the value of that synchronous connection. So once you, like once everybody was, those people who were trying to get people together at the same time, the synchronous connection, I mean, how do you actually connect aside from like being in the room at the same time, in the Zoom room at the same time, how do you actually foster connection at that kind of distance? So it's a really good question. And since most of us have been on a lot of Zoom calls in the last several months, I think it's easy to relate to the fact that it's hard, it's much harder to read a room and to kind of get a sense of what, how people are feeling. Are they connected? Are they focusing on what's happening? And so I think there are a whole set of strategies that, that can be used. So thinking a little bit differently about timing, what, how, you know, how can you use an hour? or maybe an hour and 15 minutes if you want to push it to, um, to share content and to also connect. So I don't think it's an effective strategy to get on a call and lecture for an hour and 15 minutes. So because that's, it's really hard to try to um, absorb information and stay focused and connected when you're watching a screen for that long. It's a really difficult thing to do. So how can you break a lecture down into smaller segments? Does it work to maybe put part of a lecture online that students watch in advance and think about and then use that time that you're connected to do more discussion or engagement? I know people used Zoom breakout rooms and allowed students to connect in groups and and often in the same table groups that they were in when they were together in person so that they, and I, I talked to one professor who described this immense sense of connection and relief when students were in a room with the same people they had been with before spring break, just to be able to reconnect and feel this some sense of of normalcy and um, reconnection to what school had looked and felt like before everything, everyone moved apart. Yeah. What about, I wonder what you think about the empathy side of it, because I, I'm listening and I hear the ability to maybe pay better attention to each other, to be very thoughtful about how long you're speaking at a time, how do you change it up, maybe create group conversations. But I mean, people are coming into these meetings with a lot of different baggage, probably, and everybody's coming from a different place in their life. How do you think that we and teachers and people who are leaders can give space for that moment of empathetic connection for being human together? So, yeah, I think you bring up what is probably the most important part of how we kind of help each other through this time right now. And I think that's about really seeing each other and recognizing that we are not living right now in times that are that are affecting us in the same ways that life did before we were living in a global pandemic. And that 
understanding that there are so many challenges that people are facing and living through right now that are different than the challenges that people had beforehand. And so I think part of it is, and we talk about this in the way that our team is working together too, but I'll start with thinking about the classroom, knowing that, you know, there are a lot of, there are a lot of inequities in our society and those inequities play out. Um, they're, they're visible when we look across our student body. However, when we have students on campus and students are all of our first year students and second year students are living in campus housing typically, those, there's a way that some of the visibility of those inequities is, um, it is less visible. You can get everybody internet access, for instance. That's right? right. You know, on that basic level, you can get them the technology when they're all together. Absolutely. And we, we have a program that provides technology to every incoming student. So we literally actually are providing the same piece of equipment with the same set of learning tools and wellness apps. And, you know, those those resources, we can we can do a little bit more to create a more equitable access. This is not to say that it eliminates the major inequities that students still face um, and, and that they carry with them when their families and communities are, are living in those with that kind of more um, central to their lives at home. So, but when students go home, I mean, that all of that is, all of that is gone. So we look at students who are in environments where they have reliable internet access and they have a device for everyone in their home and they have food and their families are still bringing in an income. Um, and potentially they have had better access to healthcare and have all kinds of resources in place that create an easier, a slightly easier model for navigating what is still a really hard and emotional and uncertain time. But then when you add on the layers of lack of access to internet, lack of safety potentially in a home, lack of food, and um, all of the uh, negative impacts and stress that come from those layers of impact, we suddenly saw that um, we were trying to educate students in really vastly different um, environments. And it was heartbreaking when I saw the results come back in just to look at how many students were facing food insecurity and how many of them didn't have reliable access to tools. And, and we really have to think differently about what our expectations are and how we educate students and what that education means and looks like when um, the basic access is not the same for people. One part is I think we can probably all acknowledge that universities like Ohio State and also organizations of all stripes are thinking differently about we need to have other models available to us. We need to be thoughtful and planful that maybe we need to be doing more to prepare for this. We're not going to just go back to what it was. Mm -hmm. What do you see as the things that you're hoping that you and your team and all of the people at Ohio State will be able to improve next year for learning in a virtual environment? You know, what we did in the spring, we, we and you said it this way, we call it, we called it, you know, remote learning and, and, and not um, online learning or distance education, because it's, this is, you know, the, the a, a course that has been developed to be taught online takes a lot of time and energy to design. And there are teams of people, instructional designers and videographers and people who are working to develop a really positive online experience. And when we had to make that shift in two weeks for every single course, for every single student at Ohio State, that we didn't have time to do that level of, um, of kind of production and put that amount of thought and care into the way that courses were being transitioned. And so I think there's certainly going to be a, um, a greater commitment to thinking about how we create more flexibility in the learning environments that we create. So how do we design courses that allow for potentially for people to be participating in person or remotely at any given point. If students are sick or have been exposed to COVID-19 and need to be quarantined, we need to make sure we have environments that students can learn in if they can't for a period of time be on campus. So we're thinking about that. I think for me though, when you ask what I'm most, what I'm most hopeful about, I think 
there are ways that we can use technology to create more consistent and equal access for students. I think that um, that internet should be it's a it's a public utility. I think it's something everyone should have access to because it is such an important piece of access to for learning, for civic engagement. And if we make internet access something that um, is more or less available to you based on your income, um, it is we are perpetuating some significant inequities in this country. So that's a hope that I have. I hope that also that we will be in addition to kind of thinking about how technology and equity of access to resources can promote a more equitable access to education and and contribute to um, a more just society. I also feel like in a way that we saw demonstrated and that some faculty did really, really well this spring, the ability to see your students as people and to connect to them and to be and to care about their learning and to support them as individuals, I think is has a transformative effect on not just how students learn in that class, but how they do in college and then how they do when they leave college too. So to me, thinking about how do we center that kind of human experience of college and what it means to build relationships, not just with your peers, but with the the people who are teaching you and whom you're working or researching alongside. And we know from research that, that those connections, that one meaningful connection with a faculty member can have a huge impact on a student's ability to complete their degree and the connection that they feel to the learning they had while they were here. What are the things that you know about online experiences that make them successful if you're getting to design it from the ground up? So that's a really great question. And to be fair, in my work, I actually, I'm, the team I work with is called the Office of Distance Education and E-Learning. And I am the e-learning side of the house. And my colleague, Rob Griffiths, is the distance education. So I, I actually lead the face-to-face -face side of what we do. So there are people who are much better equipped to answer that question than I am. But I'll tell you that, um, for one, being thoughtful about what, um, how to present information to people so that it is so they can learn it best in an online setting. Typically, that means, as we talked about this a little bit, typically that means not sitting on a video call and lecturing for a long period of time. It means thinking about how you chunk information so that people can um, capture relevant concepts in a small amount of time and then take a break, do some interaction, process some of that information, and then come back for more. Um, some of those, that delivery of information can happen in what we call a flipped format where people watch it on their own outside of the classroom, if you will, and then spend their class time together working through problems or having a discussion. Um, but there are also ways to, to build the delivery of information into a session and just think about whether you can break people into small groups and Zoom allows for this, whether you... Um, create opportunities to have a facilitated chat can be a really great, you can use a chat space. And it's it's very difficult to try to teach or present and monitor a chat. It's virtually impossible. It is actually a great way to see how ineffective multitasking is to try to listen to yourself talk and read a chat at the same time. Um, yeah, we're, we're recommending that people use producers or a helper of some kind on every Zoom because if you are talking, you can't read at the same time. Exactly. You just can't do both. No, it's, <laughs> not, it's not a pretty thing to watch. And so I think having, as you said, having someone who can keep an eye on chat conversation and recognizing that it can be a really fruitful kind of parallel conversation to what's happening in the video screen and having someone there who can pull together threads of questions or of contributions and then pipe up and share those or maybe open a space in the conversation to invite somebody who has mentioned something interesting in chat to share that. You know, there's it's interesting because an online environment can actually create space for people who may not be as likely to engage in a physical environment. And so being thoughtful about how you create space for people who maybe won't raise their hand in a 300 person lecture class, but might be willing to say something in a Zoom environment. It's about opening space for those questions, um, either through chat or if it's a smaller group, create taking 
creating space and taking pauses to um, invite response. I think there are versions of using a check-in question and it can be something as simple as what are two words that describe how you're feeling right now. So it doesn't have to be something long, but it gives people and they can share it. They can share it through chat or you can you can do it in a verbal form. But it gives that that can be a nice way to a kind of invite every voice into the space so that people can contribute and kind of be visible and heard. And it also is a nice way to do what we talked about earlier, which is recognize the humanity and the experience of people in the room. You know, I like to group things in my brain. You know this about me since you know me. And I kind of heard three groupings in there. One really had to do with timing and and this idea of chunking the timing out and admitting, as you said, you can't have the same length of time online looking at a screen as you can when people are face to face. So thinking about how you're going to chunk that time out so that it feels different and people stay engaged. I heard about being really thoughtful about how do you decide what happens in that very precious time that you're face to face and what can happen before and what can happen after. So how do you flip that classroom as you put it? But in a meeting, I can think about what are the things that you can take care of with pre-reads that don't need to be part of the conversation in the room. And then last, I, I really love this idea that you're talking about as this is an opportunity in some ways to increase our ability to connect and have humanity because in a face-to-face environment there are a lot of reasons people don't speak up and you might be able to find if you're creative with the way you use chat or the way you use check-in questions you might be able to find that way to get people to connect and participate in a way they might Mm -hmm. not have done in person yeah it's beautiful true and it's what's interesting to me is that a lot of these things are things we could have done some of us did do some of these things, but these many of them are not things that rely on a virtual world. But I think the combination of having circumstances that are extenuating and that are hard and and make it hard sometimes to come to school and to come to work are pushing us to connect through that difficulty and that pain um, in ways that are pretty meaningful. And I think also it is, it, when that happens, it can push individuals and teams and classrooms to think differently about how they want to connect and what they want to get out of the time they have together, and then find small changes that lead to stronger connections and more meaningful time together. And I have, there are a handful of other ideas and strategies that I've seen work both in the classroom and then also with maybe more in a professional setting. So I would say the classroom piece maybe applies whether you're connecting with students or you're connecting with a community that you serve or you're connecting with customers of a business. I think there are many strategies that can relate across any of those audiences. Um, In terms of connecting with a team, I think there's sometimes different strategies about how we work together with each other in team environment. Oh, this was so wonderful. This was really fun. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really grateful for your time. Oh, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much for listening to the Do Tell Virtually podcast. We have a lot of others in our series if you're interested in how to become your best virtual self. Whether you are a speaker, a leader, trainer, teacher, facilitator, or salesperson. You can also check us out at our website at www.articulationinc.com. That's the word articulation, I-N-C, dot com. Thanks for tuning in and spending a little time with us. Until next time, have a great day.